Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Grateful, as always, to have you here with me. And thank you for subscribing and staying subscribed. A quick reminder, uh, if you'd like to help the show directly, Patreon is a great way to do it. Please go to patreon.com slash most notorious. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash most notorious. And find out how to help keep this thing afloat month after month and year after year. I appreciate it so much and look forward to meeting you personally over there. All right, let's get on with the show. It is with great pleasure that I introduce my guest today, Eric J. Dolan. He is a prolific, best-selling author of 13 books, which have won multiple awards. And his latest, Black Flags, Blue Waters, The Epic History of America's Most Notorious Pirates, has just been released in paperback. And this is the book he is here to talk about now. Great to have you here with me. Thank you. Uh, Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You've written books about the American fur trade, the history of American whaling, the history of Boston Harbor. You obviously had a great foundation for this book with your extensive understanding of early American history. Yeah, uh, a lot of my books, uh, though, the one thing that unites all of my books, except the one that you mentioned about the cleanup of Boston Harbor, is that every book I write is on a topic I don't know much about before I write it. The cleanup of Boston Harbor was actually an outgrowth of my uh, dissertation at MIT on the the role of the courts in cleaning up uh, large-scale environmental disasters. But all the other books, I pick topics I don't know a lot about. Uh, because I want to remain engaged and interested for the 18 months to two years it takes me to work on them. But that doesn't mean I know nothing about them. And there are connections between my books. Uh, something will uh, excite me in one book, and I'll say, hey, maybe there's a broader topic to pursue in the next book. And that's how I get a launching pad. For uh, the pirate book, it was a, a little bit different. I don't know if you're going to ask me what my inspiration for the book was, but I can certainly go into that if you like. Please, I would I would love to hear it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, typically, I uh, will spend a couple of months going to libraries, walking down the aisles, taking books off the shelf that look interesting to me, reading a couple of pages or the whole book, perhaps, and trying to get something that's exciting, that's new. I also look at a lot of old newspapers and magazines. And then once I get an idea that excites me and that I think would find a good audience, I pitch it to my agent. And then if my agent is on board, we then pitch it to my longtime publisher, which is W.W. W. Norton. And if they're on board, the book's a go. But for the pirate book, it was a very different process. I had a bunch of ideas. I had about seven or eight different ideas. And I decided instead of going the normal route, I was going to pitch my ideas to my two teenage kids, Lily and Harry. So I started going through the ideas. And when I mentioned the possibility of writing a book about pirates, both of their eyes grew wide. And they said, Dad, that's it. You have to write about pirates. And I got really excited because even though I've written 13 books, neither of my kids had up to that point read any of them. So I figured this was my big chance to get my kids to read one of my books. So that's how I settled. <laughs> that's how I settled on the idea of pirates. But that was only the beginning gambit. I had to talk to my agent who was on board and then – I pitched it to my publisher, that idea and a couple of other ideas, because I wanted to give them the latitude of choosing uh, a topic that they thought would work. And I wasn't sure they were going to be excited about the pirate idea. In fact, in the letter I wrote to my editor at the time, I said, I'd love to write a book about pirates, but there have been a lot of books on pirates. So I'm not sure there's room for one other. I think there is. And I didn't say much more than that, and I had a couple of other proposals that were a little longer, the concept, and we got on a conference call, and I fully expected them to pick one of the other ideas because I had downplayed pirates a little bit, but they said something that really made me feel great as a writer. They said, we want you to write about pirates, and I said, did you read what I wrote? I was concerned that there were a lot of pirate books. I knew I could contribute something different. 
but still there's always a wariness about coming out with a book that is on a general topic that's been written about quite a lot. So they said, that's fine, Eric. There have been a lot of pirate books, but there's never been a pirate book by Eric J. Dolan. So it was really nice because they expressed faith in me. And I'm happy to report that I certainly think that my book is a great contribution to literature. It adds a lot of new things, and it certainly takes a unique slice of the golden age of piracy. So it, was, it really was a combination of my kids getting excited about it, my publisher being on board, and me being really excited to write the book that got Black Flag's Blue Waters off the ground. Oh, that's a great story. Yeah, so I've done an episode about Captain Kidd with Richard Zacks, who, by the way, has nothing but nice things to say about this book, your book. And I also did one more recently about Albert Hicks, who was kind of a gangster pirate from the mid-19th century, but he was not from the golden age of piracy. Could you give us a definition? Um, What was the golden age of piracy? Sure. I mean, pirates have been around ever since people started going into the ocean or even on lakes and rivers for that matter. As soon as there were people out on the water with things of value, there were other people that came after them trying to dispossess them of those things of value. So we have Phoenician pirates. Uh, Julius Caesar was captured by pirates. And unfortunately for them, when he was released after paying a ransom, he went back to the island where the pirates were with a massive force, and he literally crucified all the pirates that had imprisoned him, so it didn't end up very well for them. And after that, there throughout history, there have been pirates. But the golden age of piracy is the era roughly from the late 1600s to the mid-1720s, which was the most massive explosion of piracy, certainly in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, probably equal to it is the explosion of piracy that took place in uh, China and seas around there. But in the Atlantic, the Golden Age is the time when we had the most number of pirates uh, pillaging ships, the most interesting stories about pirates, the most interesting characters, also some of the most successful pirates of all time, and many of the pirates that weren't successful and ended up being hanged at the end of a noose. So it's really this concentrated period that most people think about when they think about pirates. The Pirates of the Caribbean, Johnny Depp, that whole movie series is really about the second half of the Golden Age that started after the War of the Spanish Succession. Uh, Around 1715 it started and it lasted to the mid-1720s. But there's a whole other part of the Golden Age of piracy, which is in the late 1600s to around 1700 which I also talk about, and that was a very different period. That was a period when a lot of pirates from the American colonies were going around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean, and they were pillaging Mughal or Muslim ships transiting from India to the Red Sea ports of Jeddah and Mocha, and they were bringing all that treasure back to the colonies, and they were welcomed with open arms, even though piracy was illegal within the British Empire. Essentially, these pirates were the the fathers, sons, and brothers of the colonists, and at a time when the colonies were being starved of currency and treated rather shabbily by the mother country, the colonies, in effect, uh, thumbed their nose at the British laws that said they needed to bring pirates to trial. And instead, they welcomed the treasure that they brought back, in part because they were going halfway around the world and they were robbing, quote unquote, infidels and heathens. In other words, non-Christians. And the colonists, as many in the Western world, had a condescending view of those people. So here these pirates, up till about 1700, were enriching the colonies. They were welcomed by the colonies. Then the mother country really clamped down, and by about 1700, the so-called Red Sea pirate phase, when because they were going into the Red Sea, came to an end. Then there was the War of the Spanish Succession, where there wasn't much piracy in the American colonies or emanating from the American colonies. And then after the War of the Spanish Succession, for a number of reasons, piracy came roaring back. But this time, the targets of opportunity were not in the Indian Ocean. Instead, Pirates were attacking American or English ships. They were from the American colonies that were coming from colonial ports and transiting to Europe 
and back. So that's the broad era that I talk about in this book. And one of the things that is a little bit different about how this book comes at it is even though I talk quite a bit about the pirates who operated primarily in the Caribbean, that is not the main focus of the book. I am focused on those pirates who either left from the American colonies to plunder ships or the pirates, no matter where they came from, who plundered ships along the American coast. So I was really trying to zero in on the American colonial experience with piracy, which is a big part of the golden age, but it's not the entire golden age because there was a lot of piracy taking place in the Caribbean that didn't really filter or flow over into the colonies. But it's related, and I talk about that history as well. Well, that's part of what makes your book so unique and interesting, is that you know so much about these colonial American ports and this relationship between the pirates who would sail in and the colonials working and living near these ports who would benefit from the presence of these pirates. Again, as you said, especially early on in this golden era of piracy. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating story. I it, it really is a fascinating story. I, I enjoyed researching this book. I enjoyed writing the book. Uh, one of the questions I'm often asked is, who is my favorite pirate? I really have to rephrase the question. I don't have a favorite it, it, reality. Almost all these pirates were miserable individuals that often did horrific things, but some of them were more fascinating than others. And this might give you an insight into my personality. I'm just joking about that. But the most fascinating pirate to me is Edward Lowe, because he was clearly the most sadistic and uh, I think psychotic pirate that ever operated. And I'll just tell you briefly about some of the things that he did in the early 1720s operating off the American coastline and plundering a number of ships. One of his signature moves was cutting off people's noses and ears and roasting them and forcing the victims to consume their own flesh before they were then run through with a cutlass or killed in some other manner. Another time when he captured a ship that had a captain on it who had a bag of gold and silver that was hanging over the rail of the ship attached to a rope, that captain cut that rope so that the gold and silver fell into the ocean instead of into Captain Ned Lowe's hands. And when Ned Lowe found out about this treachery, at least in his eyes, he not only killed the captain, but all 32 of his men. So he is one of the most notorious pirates of the Golden Age. But one of the, one of the fascinating things that I discovered is that most pirates – didn't have to kill their victims. In fact, they didn't want to kill their victims. What they really wanted to do was win by intimidation. And that's part of the reason that the Black Flag or the Jolly Roger came into being after the War of the Spanish Succession. It was because it was a way in which pirates could signal to a merchant ship or any ship they were about to plunder that, hey, we're a bunch of pirates. We're armed to the teeth. If you resist, we will do whatever we have to take over your ship, and that includes killing you. But if you surrender, the odds are we'll take what we want and leave you to go on your voyage as you may. And that's, in fact, what often happened. Pirates were successful most often through intimidation. However, every once in a while, pirates had to refresh their horrific brand identity, their their brand identity that they were vicious individuals and uh, who could do horrific things because by refreshing their brand identity every once in a while, the word got around to all of these merchant ships, resist at your peril. And most of them decided that the better part of valor was not to resist, take the losses and go on their way. So that was one of the fascinating things I discovered about uh, pirates. But they're, they're really – there's a reason we romanticize them. There's a reason we still think about pirates, and there's a reason that I think a lot of people enjoyed this book is there's something compelling about the tales of pirates, no matter how horrific they are. But even more importantly in my eyes, the reason I was excited about this book is it's not just a book about 
plunder and booty. It's a book about how pirates were an integral part of colonial America and colonial and British imperial history during this time. And so it's really a story about American history and British history that uses pirates as a backbone to tell the tale. Interesting. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I got asked what, who my favorite serial killer was the other day. <laughs> How do you answer a question like that without feeling guilty? Oh, my favorite ser- serial killer is. <laughs> but I want to, um, I, I want to rewind um, just a bit on Ned Lowe. I was going to ask you about him. He was uh, just a despicable, despicable character. Uh, I mean, you talk about pirate stereotypes. And I do want to ask you in just a bit about breaking some of these these pirate stereotypes. And maybe we'll get to that when we talk about Blackbeard in, in just a bit. But Ned Lowe really fits some of these stereotypes of pirates as just being these terrible, murderous, nautical thugs. And some would even argue that he was a serial killer, right? Have you thought about that? Would you make that argument? Hmm. Uh, (laughs) On the most notorious, I would definitely make that argument. But (laughs) I hadn't thought about it that way. I hadn't thought about it that way before. But in a sense, he was a serial killer. He killed quite a few people. And he did it in a serial fashion. Uh, There are were perhaps different motivations. He wasn't this lone actor. He's part of a larger group, but he was the leader. He started off in Boston and he worked in a shipyard and he was a rigger. And as the story goes and what we've been able to piece together about his early years is his wife died in childbirth. He was bereft, really upset. He decided to become a logwood cutter, which at the time logwood, which was a tree that grew down in Central America was incredibly valuable because the heart of the logs or the tree was this was reddish and they could extract a reddish purplish dye from these logs that was worth an incredible amount in Europe. So there were a huge number of ships at this time that went in the early 1700s that went down to Belize and Honduras and areas like that basically strip mine the land of the logwood and brought it back to Europe. So he signed on to a logwood ship that was going down off Honduras. And uh, he probably had this plan in mind for a while and it precipitated quickly when he came back from shore after cutting logwood and he asked the captain for a break and a drink. And the captain said, essentially, no, you've got to go back to shore and do more work. And then uh, Ned Lowe took a pot shot at the captain, missed him, killed somebody else, and he and the guys in the boat uh, that was ferrying them to and from shore took off and they launched – that launched his life as a pirate and he slowly went from smaller ships to larger ships. And at one point he had a couple of rather large ships under his command, uh, probably well over 100 individuals. He plundered many ships. He killed quite a few People, often for no good reason, one of the most horrific stories was when he was near Nantucket, he captured a ship that had a uh, whaling captain on board, Nathaniel Skiff. And one of the things that pirates used to do during the Golden Age, which is well documented, since many of them uh, became pirates after they mutinied or they were uh, naval or merchant marines who had been treated very poorly by despotic captains. So when they became pirates, they decided not to recreate that kind of society. And they really had a vendetta against captains of the ships that they captured if they found out that those captains had treated their crew in abysmal manner. So when they captured this small whaling sloop with Nathaniel Skiff on board, one of the questions that Ned Lowe asked the men, how has your captain treated you? And all of the crew, according to the record, sang the praises of Nathaniel Skiff. And for whatever reason, maybe his overwhelming sadism, uh, Ned Lowe uh, decided that he wasn't going to spare the captain in a real sense. He said, because your men have spoken so well from you, 
I'll essentially make your death a quick one. First, he cut off part of his nose, and uh, then he basically stabbed him a number of times and finally ran him through and killed poor Nathaniel Skiff and then told uh, took the ship and told the other whalemen to get in their whaleboats and row back to Nantucket, which was some – many miles away, and they ultimately made it back to Nantucket to tell this story after almost 90 hours of rowing. So uh, Ned Lowe was a horrific character, and one of the reasons we know so much about him actually has a connection to my hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts. When he was up off of Nova Scotia, he plundered or captured a number of fishing vessels, one of which was a fishing sloop from Marblehead, Massachusetts, and Ned Lowe was in need of additional crewmen, and he would ask people that he captured to sign on as pirates. Some of them would, others wouldn't, and he would force many of them to become pirates, and one of those was a Marblehead fisherman named Philip Ashton, who was basically conscripted or forced to become a pirate on Ned Lowe's ship and was on that ship for the better part of, I think it was eight months. And he refused to sign the pirate code or the articles of agreement among the pirates, which sort of confirms your membership as a pirate. But he stayed on board and he got to see very close at hand how Ned Lowe and the other pirates operated. And then when he was in uh, the Bay of Honduras, there was a small uninhabited island called Roatan. The pirates went onto the island to get some water to refresh their supplies. And while he was on the island, he snuck away from the landing group, ran into the dense brush. And after they couldn't find him, the pirates took off and Philip Ashton stayed on Roatan for the better part of 16 or 17 months, totally alone. And then he was joined by a couple of other Spanish individuals. And finally, after two years on Roatan, Philip Ashton was repatriated by a Salem, Massachusetts brig, the captain of which Philip Ashton actually knew. And on that ship, he was taken all the way back to Salem, Massachusetts, and then he walked a couple of miles back to Marblehead where he knocked on the front door of his parents' house. And when they saw him, it was as if he had come back from the dead for, because, in fact, he had. They assumed he was dead. And what was really great for me and all other historians is that a local minister decided to take down – Philip Ashton's story and publish it as a small book and use the story as an allegory to sort of talk about the benevolence of God and bringing him back to civilization. But in the course of telling that religious story, he also includes a lot of details about Philip Ashton's time with Ned Lowe and his time on Roatan. And it's one of the most fascinating uh, books from the early 18th century that you can read, and I used it as a major source for that part of the book. So that that's part of the reason that we know so much or know a lot more than we would have otherwise about Ned Lowe. Oh, that's wild. There has been, in the past, some debate about how Ned Lowe met his end, right? Yeah, they, we're... we're, we're we're not really sure how Ned Lowe met his end. Uh, there are a couple of different stories. One has uh, his men rising up and basically mutinying and putting him, abandoning him on an island. Another one, I think, has the French capturing him and then him ultimately being hanged. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened to him. And that's one of the problems of telling the stories about pirates. There are both opportunities – and obstacles to telling these stories, because as you might imagine, pirates were not particularly well educated. None of them sat down after their careers, should they have made it to the end of their pirating life alive. None of them sat down and wrote biographies or memoirs of themselves and their experience. So 
That doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of information about pirates and piracy. We do. There are hundreds of thousands of letters that went between the colonies and the mother country from the 1600s to the 1700s between officials and uh, customs officers and individuals writing to parliament where they complained and talked about pirates and piracy. And all of those letters have been digitized or held in the National Archives of uh, Britain, which I used extensively. So there's a lot of information written by people who were plundered by pirates, who were, were observing them. There also were many pirates who were captured and brought to justice. There was a trial in which depositions would have been taken where there was a lot of information provided about one trans what transpired during the pirate voyage so that they could get the facts straight and ultimately determine that these people were in fact pirates, were guilty, and they should be hanged, which almost invariably they were. So there is a lot of information out there to tell the story, but by the same token, the only thing that is not in evidence as much as an historian would like are the actual voices unfettered and direct coming from the pirates themselves. So that doesn't mean you can't tell the story. There's a great story to be told, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of, of meat to the story. But I would love if there was such a thing as a time machine to go back to this era and sit down at a pub and have some grog with a pirate and ask them a bunch of questions about why they did what they did, why did they want to become pirates, how did they operate, and uh, what are their perceptions of their own lives. I think that would only add to the story. I don't think it would fundamentally change the story because you can get some of that from the documents that we do have, but it would just be great if you get some more of their voice direct and unmediated coming to us from the past. So what would a typical pirate's life have been like on one of these ships? What might have they experienced? Right. In, in general, uh, most pirates were in their late teens, early 20s. Uh, there were very few really old pirates. Uh, those pirates who chose to pursue this life, whether through mutiny or some other course, would have, just like the ones that were forced, would have experienced a similar lifestyle. Most pirates would be on sloops. That was the workhorse of the day. They might be 60 or 70 foot long ships, and they would be very crowded because whereas a fishing sloop of that size might have a crew of five or 10 at the most doing work, uh, on a pirate ship that was 70 or 80 feet long, you could easily have more than 100 Pirates. So it was a very crowded experience. Uh, shipboard life during this era was very dirty, smelly. There were likely rats and cockroaches on board. They were often at sea for great lengths of time. So the food was uh, often quite miserable and not always very fresh, heavy on the meat, the salted meat, the hard tack, and whatever they could plunder from ships they took at sea or things that they could gather from the places where they were able to land. And those places became fewer and fewer as time uh, passed. So we've got crowded conditions, uh, miserable sleeping conditions. They often slept on the deck or maybe down below in the hold. Uh, the food was rather miserable. Often the water was quite uh, polluted. However, they would rarely drink water if they had the chance to drink alcohol. And the one thing that is undisputably true is that not only pirates of the era, but everybody in the colonies drank a lot of alcohol for a variety of reasons. But pirates in particular loved their, you know, rum or Madeira wine or whatever other spirits they could capture on these plundered ships. And no pirate was ever happier than when they overhauled another ship that had 20 pipes of wine, which are large containers of wine or a bunch of barrels of rum that was coming up, uh, you know, coming out of the colonies or, or transported between islands in the Caribbean. So they would go on great benders 
and they would often get quite drunk. And there's some stories I tell in the book of pirates who were surprised by those who were sent out to apprehend them. And they were all drunk and asleep on board when they were attacked. So they had to quickly come to and try to defend themselves. So we've got a, you know, it's, it's not a very nice lifestyle, but it wasn't much, it wasn't that dissimilar to people on a merchant ship or even on a naval ship that was at sea for a long uh, period of time. Another thing about a pirate ship is it had to have armaments, and the key one was were cannons. So if they were lucky enough to capture a ship that had cannons on board, they would use those. Many times they would have to reconfigure the deck to handle additional cannons that they would capture over time because the fiercer – that the pirates could appear upon inspection through a spyglass or a telescope from the merchant ship, the more likely it was that that merchant ship would surrender without giving a fight. The other thing about the pirate life is contrary to what you might think, pirates didn't really interact that much with women. There were rarely women on board pirate ships, uh, very, very rarely. And so it was sort of a unisex pirate community. They did go ashore, these pirate hangouts. Madagascar was one in the Indian Ocean, and many pirates would have sex with local Madagascar natives. In the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, it is true that in Nassau, there was a what some people have called a pirate republic, although I don't really think it was a political institution as much as it was a place for pirates to rest, relax, reconfigure, decide where they were going to go next to plunder and sort of hang out during the winter and then go north in the summer. And there were women on those on, on those islands and there were some prostitutes. So. But they they weren't womanizing all the time. That that uh, image is not a reflection of reality. The other thing about being a pirate during this time, and again, you have to make a division between the Red Sea pirates before 1700, many of whom lived out their life and actually reintegrated into society and then melted away from the historical record from those pirates in the 17-teens and 1720s when you have Ned Lowe and Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet. An awful lot of those pirates, even if they did, even if they were lucky enough to have captured ships that had treasure on board, very, very few of them were able to live out the rest of their life. There were hundreds and hundreds of pirates who were killed in battle from uh, British warships and other ships, merchant ships that fought back. And there were hundreds and hundreds of pirates that were captured and hanged. So the final element of their life is that for most pirates of the second half of the golden age of piracy, for most of them, their lives were short and brutish, you know, sort of like Leviathan and what Hobbes said. And it, it was looking back on it, from my perspective, it was a rather miserable life. Uh, maybe they enjoyed it while it lasted and they didn't have many alternatives that they thought were equally as appealing on land. So they became pirates. But looking at it through the lens of the present, it was a rather miserable, usually short, not very financially remunerative uh, life on board the sea, you know, on, on the sea. Right. So what was the difference between a pirate and a buccaneer? Uh, <laughs> there's a thin line that separates pirates from buccaneers. Essentially, oh, oh no, buccaneers. I think say, Did you say privateer or buccaneer? Well, I was going to ask you about privateers as well. Okay, let me, let, <laughs> let me do buccaneer first. Okay. Sure. Buccaneer is just buccaneer is just another term for pirate. Essentially, in the mid 1600s, there were a number of uh, French, Spanish, English, Dutch individuals in the Caribbean who I who had either jumped ship or had been indentured servants and they had escaped and they recongregated themselves or collected themselves 
on Hispaniola, which is modern day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And there in the 1620s and 1630s, they would capture the hogs and cattle that had been brought over by Christopher Columbus and other earlier explorers that were on the island and were fairly plentiful. They would capture those animals and then they would cut up their meat into small strips and they would put them on something called a boucan, which is essentially a wooden frame that was over a smoldering fire, and they would turn that meat into essentially beef and pork jerky, and then they would go out to passing Spanish and sometimes other ships, and they would sell that meat to the Spaniards, and that's how they would make money. What happened is Spain thought it owned the entire Western Hemisphere, uh, and they got a little bit annoyed by these interlopers on Hispaniola, even though they were selling them meat, and they decided to run them off Hispaniola. And at that time, they were called boucaneers because they, they, they cured this meat over a boucan, so they were boucaneers, which in English became buccaneers. So the Spanish went in there. They had a massive fight. They killed a number of the buccaneers. The buccaneers were run off of Hispaniola, but they regrouped just to the north of Hispaniola on a small island called Tortuga, and they built a uh, small fort. They were there for a couple of years, pursuing the same livelihood. The Spanish got irritated once again, and they attacked on Tortuga. And many of the buccaneers were killed. Now, the ones that remained, about 300 of them, decided, OK, we've had enough of curing meat and selling it to the Spanish ships that pass by. Instead of selling them meat, let's attack the Spanish ships. Let's become pirates. And that's exactly what they did. They built a, a, a much more substantial fort on Tortuga. They armed themselves. They got into smaller than larger ships, and they started plundering Spanish and ships of other nationalities throughout the Caribbean. So they essentially were pirates just by another name. Now, privateers is a slightly different category. During times of war at this period in history, countries were legally allowed to give armed merchant ships a letter of mark or a privateering license, which essentially gave them legal permission to attack the ships of the enemy, the enemy being the, the country with whom the government that issued the letter of mark was at war. So they were legally allowed to attack enemy shipping. If they captured an enemy ship, they could bring it back to a port in, let's say if you were an English privateer, you bring it back to London or some port, there's an adjudication process, and you as the privateer got a portion of the proceeds from that ship and whatever it might be holding. So essentially, privateering was licensed piracy, and it was a way in which governments of this era could expand and enlarge the size of their navy by enlisting formerly civilian merchant vessels into the war effort. Now, what happened at the end of a war, all the letters of mark were repealed by the crown. So overnight, once the peace was signed, these privateers were out of business. Now, the skill set that they had is exactly the same skill set that pirates would use. So a lot of pirates who suddenly found themselves out of the private, a lot of privateers, I mean, who suddenly found themselves out of the privateering business and not having very good opportunities on land or in the Navy because after the war ended, the British Navy at least contracted rather dramatically. So suddenly these privateers had skills that were not needed by anyone. So many of those privateers naturally gravitated towards becoming Pirates, And that was part of the reason why there was such an explosion in piracy after the war, the Spanish succession, which ended in 1713, because overnight, almost overnight, 
the Navy contracted from 50,000 people to about 30,000 people, and the economy of the British Empire was going through a mini recession. So there weren't that many jobs in the merchant marines either. And a lot of these former privateers said, I got to do something to make money. I've got these skills. I want to stay in the ocean. And they heard all the stories about the few pirates in the late 1600s that had come home rich. And they said, well, if they could do it, then maybe I could do it. And they became pirates. Interesting. So in your book, you run through a list of famous and not so famous American pirates, and some were more honorable than we might believe, and some worse than we might have imagined, like Ned Lowe. But one of the, the pirates that wasn't as horrible as we might think he was, was, was Blackbeard. He's got such a rotten reputation now. <laughs> could, could you give us some examples of why he might not be so deserving of it? Yeah, Blackbeard is an amazing a story. Essentially, he was only uh, around or a pirate for about a year and a half. We don't know a lot about him before he became a pirate or exactly where he was born or what he was doing. Many people felt he was a privateer during the War of the Spanish Succession, and then he turned to piracy. However he got there, he became a pirate, and his career only lasted about a year and a half. And to, be, to tell you the truth, he wasn't particularly successful in terms of collecting a huge amount of wealth. He did at one time have five ships under his command, including a very large uh, ship, which he christened Queen Anne's Revenge. So he had a formidable armada and as many as 400 or maybe even 500 men under his command, and they did terrorize uh, Charleston, South Carolina. They blockaded the harbor for the better part of a week, demanded uh, only a chest of medicine, because apparently a lot of men on board Blackbeard ships probably had a sexually transmitted disease, perhaps uh, syphilis or gonorrhea, and he wanted to treat them. And uh, there's been a lot of debate as to why he didn't demand more in the way of ransom, but there, there are reasons I talk about in the book why that might not have been the case. Be that as is may, once he blockaded Charleston, South Carolina, and then went up the coast and attacked other ships, his reputation grew within the colonies in part because of his rather dramatic name. He was referred to as Blackbeard. His real name was probably Edward Teach or Edward Thatch. But Blackbeard – just brings up an image in your mind, and it was something that the press caught on to. So it, in effect, made him a larger-than-life character a bit while he was alive. But I believe that his reputation was really sealed, and the reason we remember him so much today is because of a book that was written in 17. 17- 24 by Captain Charles Johnson called The History or The General History of Pirates. And in it, there's a section about Blackbeard where he basically fabricates some information about Blackbeard that makes him much larger than life. Like there's a story that every once in a while he had to keep his men in line and show him who who was the real boss. And one time he shot one of his uh, lieutenants, Israel Hands, in the knee under the table, which – didn't happen. Uh, there's also a story that he had 14 wives at one time. No evidence that that was true. He used to prostitute his wives to his men. That's another salacious story that I think was added to sell more copies of the book. So he comes across in this very, very popular book written right at the end of the golden age of piracy when people were starting to read books with great avidity. He comes across as a larger-than-life person, sort of a meteor streaking across the colonial and British imperial sky. And I think it was that bit of public relations that set him on the course to the point that today he is remembered as one of the greatest pirates. He is certainly, along with Captain Kidd, I think the most recognized of all Golden Age Pirates, But in reality, if you look at his career and what we know, we actually know, transpired, he's not one of the most successful pirates. He's not even, I would argue, one of the most fascinating pirates. But because of his rather dramatic end, 
there was a battle between his men and British Marines, including Lieutenant Robert Maynard, off of Ocracoke Island on November 18th of 1718. And during that battle, Blackbeard was killed, and then Maynard cut off Blackbeard's head, hung it on the bowsprit of Blackbeard's sloop, took that sloop and some of the remaining pirates back to Williamsburg, where they were put on trial. So that final denouement, that, that, that imagery, which was even taken by journalists of the era and puffed up into more than what I think really transpired, you know, this great almost Hollywood-like epic death scene that was even talked about at the time. So that helped cement his reputation as well. And you remember before I talked about how It'd be great to have more information about pirates. One of the sad things that happened is there was a trial in Williamsburg where many of Blackbeard's men that were still alive were put on trial, found guilty, and hanged. But years later, there was a fire, and all of the materials related to the trial, including depositions and other information, was burned. And because of that, we have nothing from the trial. And based on other trials that occurred at around the same time where the information was archived and we can look at it today, we are missing a valuable trove of information. It would have told us a lot more about Blackbeard, where he had been, what he had done, and what he was like as a pirate. But unfortunately, that information is gone. Wow. So did the demise of, of Blackbeard help bring about the end of the, the golden age of piracy? Yeah, that was right when it was really starting to go down uh, quickly. What happened? There were a number of forces. Uh, again, think about it. Before 1700, the Red Sea men that went into the Indian Ocean, they were welcomed by the colonies because they were providing something of value, money, silk, tea, other things that the colonists really wanted, and they were hard-pressed to get from the mother country, which often treated the colonies rather shabbily. Now, fast forward after the, Spani the War of the Spanish Succession. Now, pirates, instead of going far away and, and taking money from another culture and bringing it back to the colonies, now the pirates were plundering colonial ships. So you really have to understand uh, history by looking at whose ox is being gored and where the money is flowing and who's taking the money. So when pirates were benefiting the colonies, the pirates, the col colonists loved the pirates and welcomed them with open arms. However, when pirates were attacking colonial ships and taking away from the bottom line, then the colonies were suddenly aligned with the mother country. And in a pincer-like fashion, pirates were attacked from both sides. Now, England, or Great Britain at this time, after 1707, Great Britain uh, really helped with this because they sent five men of war, large British warships, to the colonies from Canada all the way down to the Caribbean, and uh, a couple of very notorious pirates, including part of Ned Lowe's gang, were captured by one or more of these British warships. Also, the colonies, which prior to 1700 were very reluctant to prosecute any pirates after the War of the Spanish Succession, they were eager to prosecute any pirates that were captured. And there were more – there were 68 pirates that were hanged in the colonies from Charleston all the way up to Newport. And in the broader Atlantic during this time, there were more than 400 pirates that were hanged. The king also issued a pardon for pirates. There are probably two of them at this time. So pirates could come in from out of the cold and have their, old, their whole history expunged and then, in effect, have a new life. And a number of pirates did decide to accept the pardon. And also, there was a major effort on the part of England to crack down on the pirate 
republic, I guess you'd call it, in uh, the Bahamas. And they sent a bunch of warships and a new governor down to Nassau. They essentially said, okay, you pirates have been using this for a couple of years as your you know, hangout. Time's up. Government's here. We're taking over. You know, uh, if you oppose us, we will kill you. And it worked. Uh, the pirates were run out of Nassau in the Bahamas. And as a result, at that point, the pirates really had no place where they could retreat and be unmolested. They were persona non grata along the entire Atlantic seaboard. So you can envision it as a noose, literally and figuratively, slowly closing around the collective pirate's necks as you went through the late 17-teens and into the 1720s. And by 1726, when my book ends, there were hardly any pirates left. Uh, it just wasn't a way of life that held out even the remotest prospect of success. And they faded away for a while. But as you and your listeners know, we still have pirates today. And there were some explosions of piracy in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. There were the Tripoli pirates uh, off near the Mediterranean, the northern horn of Africa. Uh, then in the 18 teens and 1820s, there was a massive explosion of piracy in the Gulf of Mexico. And you had pirates like the famous Jean Lafitte, uh, who were active at that time. And the American Navy was sent down to the Caribbean to basically tamp down on piracy. And they did a very good job of that. But there were brief outbursts of piracy throughout the 1800s, 1900s, especially in the Far East. And today we still have Somali pirates. Uh, two summers ago, there was a big explosion of piracy off the Venezuelan coast. And uh, there are still pirates. And I believe, unfortunately, there will be pirates for as long as there is commerce at sea that is not well protected and has things of value on board or can be captured and ransomed for a valuable sum. So I'm not going to ask you who your favorite pirate is. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got so many colorful characters in your book. Is there one that especially piques your interest? One that you personally thought was especially fascinating? Yes, uh, there are a couple. One I'll mention, uh, some of your listeners might have heard of him uh, because there have been some stories in the last couple of years, he's been brought up a couple of times, but I still think, by and large, he's not well known to the general public. And I think he's one of the most fascinating pirates of all because of his background and his strange and relatively short career. And that's a guy named Steed Bonnet, who started out life in an aristocratic or at least upper middle class family in Barbados. His family owned a sugar plantation, which was uh, one of the main uh, forms of imperial income in the Caribbean at the time. And he was on track to take over the plantation and live a relatively carefree and wealthy life. But something happened where he decided to become a pirate. And the historical record doesn't tell us exactly what it is. Uh, some people say that he went a little mad, perhaps insane. Uh, other people at the time reported that maybe his decision to become a pirate had something to do with uh, some discomforts that he had in married life. And if that's in fact true, he had a pretty miserable marriage. But uh, be that as it may, Steed Bonnet, uh, probably in his late 20s or maybe early 30s, not exactly sure of his age, but he went to sea, but he did so in a strange manner. He took his money and he built a 70, 75 foot sloop specifically for the pirate trade. And in the captain's cabin, he had it lined with bookshelves so that he could bring along his own personal library, thinking perhaps that he would have plenty of time to read in his down downtime. And most pirates who joined pirate ships were not hired. They were not given a salary. They got a cut in whatever plunder was taken. But to start off his pirate adventure, Steed Bonnet 
hired uh, about 70 or 80 men to come along. <laughs> and they took off from Barbados. He had some success. He had more failures. Uh, basically, his men ran the ship because he didn't know much about sailing. And then in an unusual way, he came into contact with Blackbeard in Nassau. And Blackbeard and some other pirates, and this is right after he had a bad interaction with a Spanish naval ship in which Steed Bonnet and his men got the worst end of it. Their ship was really uh, beaten up a lot with cannon fire, and Steed Bonnet was injured quite severely. So when he pulled into Nassau with his damaged ship and his damaged person, Blackbeard and a couple of other pirates convinced him to take it easy. Let Blackbeard become the captain of your fine sailing sloop and you and you can you can take it easy and and I will uh, run run the ship. So that's what happened for a while. Uh, They were in league uh, and, and did fairly well. But then they had a falling out or just decided to separate. And Steed Bonnet's career went in one direction. Blackbeard's in another. Steed Bonnet. Uh, decided at first to get a pardon from the governor of North Carolina and give up piracy. He, he claimed that he wanted to become a privateer in the Caribbean uh, to hunt Spanish ships. But soon after getting his pardon from the governor, for whatever reason, Steed Bonnet and his men fell back into piracy along the Delaware coast. And uh, word got around that there were some pirates at the mouth of the Cape Fear River People uh, thought it might be Steed Bonnet. Uh, uh, Colonel William Rett and a bunch of men went out. They went out first in search of another pirate, but they couldn't find him. And then they heard about this pirate up in the Cape Fear River. It ended up being Steed Bonnet. There was a running battle. Many of Steed Bonnet's men were killed. Steed Bonnet was taken prisoner, brought back to Charleston, South Carolina. Before he and his men could be put on trial, Steed Bonnet and one of his men escaped They were recaptured about a day later. The trial was a sensational affair in large part because a lot of the upper class people in Charleston pleaded with the judge to be lenient with Steed Bonnet and uh, perhaps just let him go or at least send him to England where he could ask for the uh, queen's pardon. And the reason they wanted to do this is because they argued that he, like they, were aristocrats, were upper class individuals. and They shouldn't be treated in this manner. Well, the judge was a stickler for the law, and he decided, sorry, I'm going to try him. And he tried him, and Steed Bonnet and 19 of his men were found guilty, and they were hanged on the edge of Charleston Harbor, and that brought – an ignominious end to Steed Bonnet's short but colorful uh, pirate career. So he has to clearly, because of his background and the trajectory of his career, I think he has to be one of the more interesting pirates. There's another pirate named Henry Avery, who's probably one of the more famous pirates of the day, and he was a Red Sea man, and uh, he was part of a mutiny, and the ship went around the Cape of Good Hope, into the Indian Ocean, captured some of the Emperor Aurangzeb's largest ships. He and his men came back to the Caribbean and then ultimately filtered back into society in Ireland and Britain and the colonies, many of them with well over a thousand pieces of eight to their name, which was a lot of money back then. And even though the British government wanted to find Henry Avery, try him and hang him to prove to the Mughal emperor that England was serious about tamping down on pirates who were putting a major crimp in the East Indian trade, which was so important to the the British Empire, unfortunately, they never caught Henry Avery, uh, got a couple of his men, and – Henry Avery became the stuff of legend in the early 1700s. There was even a play that uh, was performed in London on Drury Lane called The Successful Pirate, in which a Henry Avery-like character not only successfully got away with his spoils, but he also 
lived on a small pirate kingdom, perhaps Madagascar, in the Indian Ocean, and he married the emperor's daughter. Now, none of that ever happened. He sort of melted into the countryside of uh, in in England. Uh, exactly what happened to Henry Avery, we don't don't know. But even at the time, he was held up as an example of a pirate who had gotten away with it. And it was Henry Avery's image and the image of some other pirates that had also become wealthy that danced in the minds of many of the sailors and other individuals who decided to become pirates themselves in the 17 teens and 20s. Because just like people walking into a casino who at the outset are convinced that they're going to have luck and they're going to hit it rich and then a couple of hours later walk out with their pockets empty, that was the fate of most pirates. But at least when they got into this line of work, if you want to call it that, many of them were able to sustain their hopes and dreams by fantasizing that they would be the next Henry Avery. Interesting. <laughs> so I've got a final question for you. So one of the most irritating things, I, I think I've seen it on Facebook. <laughs> it's called Talk Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> so what is that? Can you explain that the parrots, the peg legs, the eye patches... I, I know you address this at the end of your book, some yeah. of this stuff, but but can you talk about how some of this mythology has developed over time? Sure. I, I have nothing against international talk like a pirate day. It rolls around every September 19th. I, I, I don't know the history in and out, but a couple of guys got together many years ago and decided, hey, we should have this international talk like a pirate day. And it's become a, a huge thing among a small section of the populace and uh, for a day people go around saying arg and shiver me timbers and I matey and they wear eye patches and hooks and peg legs. Uh, <laughs> a lot of that is just pure baloney. Uh, it's Hollywood imagery and uh, language that uh, has filtered throughout the culture and the whole concept of a pirate saying arg or ar. We have no evidence that any pirates used that term. However, in the mid-1900s, there was an actor, uh, Robert Newton, from southwest England who played Blackbeard and Long John Silver. And he dispensed args and shiver me timbers and all those things with relish because R apparently is sort of like A for Canadians or eh uh, that's said in the southwest of England. And he – sort of spruced up the language of the pirate, and that has stuck with us ever since then. As for eye patches, I have no doubt that some pirates had eye patches. I did not come across a single reference to a pirate that I either wrote about or read about at the time that had an eye patch. But many mariners, or at least not many, a significant number of mariners had eye patches because there were accidents and they were in fights. And if you lost an eye, you would put a patch over it. I also found no indication of any pirate who had a hook for a prosthetic. However, at this time, there were prosthetics and some people had hooks or claws, but uh, the same goes for a peg leg. There were people who had wooden legs. I found no reference to any pirate that had a peg leg. And think about it, a peg leg or a, a hook for a hand would be a real detriment for a sailor on board a heaving and rolling ship on the open ocean. So the odds are if a pirate were to have his leg blown off and he had to get a wooden leg, he might quickly leave the profession of piracy and the same if he lost an arm. And in fact, the pirate's go code or the articles of agreement had clauses in it that would reward individual pirates who had lost an arm, a leg, or an eye in battle with a certain percentage or an exact number of silver pieces of eight or gold doubloons, part of the booty. So it was sort of like an early form of workmen's compensation. So most of the stuff that you hear on International Talk Like a Pirate Day is made up and a lot of fun. 
And most of what you see in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie is not necessarily close to the truth. However, the one thing that is, from what we can gather, is the outrageous dress or lavish dress of Captain Jack Sparrow or Johnny Depp, uh, the actor. There are references in the historical record to pirates dressing rather flamboyantly and often when they would plunder a ship that maybe had some wealthy individuals on board or was carrying clothes or silks or jewels or whatever from one place to another, they would take that and they would often adorn themselves with it. And in effect, it was another way of differentiating themselves or essentially giving their middle finger to the society of which they were no longer a part. Because in society in the early 1700s and late 1600s, there were sartorial laws. Basically, if you were a certain uh, person, a certain class of individual, you could only wear certain types of clothes. And the more flamboyant and flashy the clothes, the higher your class. So a lot of pirates took the opportunity to dress in that fashion. Uh, I, I'm sure some of them just found it fun. Others, uh, it was a way uh, to basically thumb their nose at society. So that part of Johnny Depp, at least, is uh, is probably accurate, at least for some pirates. So, so your book has just been released in paperback just last week, in fact. That's right. So how do people get a copy, find out more about you and the other books you've written as well? Yeah, that's pretty easy. I mean, the, the, the book uh, should be available at any – it is available at any bookstore online or brick and mortar. If they don't physically have it in the store, they can order it from a distributor or my publisher. So if you want to get a copy, there is no obstacle to – doing so. If you want to find out more about me and also more about the book, I've got a website, which is www.ericjdolan, that's E-R-I-C-J-A-Y-D-O-L-I-N.com. And if you go there, I've got information on all my books. I've also got the entire introduction of Black Flags, Blue Waters, which you can read. So it'll give you a lay of the land and a sense of whether you want to read the rest of the book. There is also a very nice, if I do say so myself, book trailer that I put together with the help of my daughter about Black Flags, Blue Waters. So there's like a four or five minute video that will give you a rough idea of what's in the book and a lot of visual imagery. You can also find out about my other books there and where I'm speaking. I give a lot of talks for Black Flags, Blue Waters. I've already given most of my talks. I gave almost 70 talks throughout New England, New York, uh, Mississippi, uh, Oregon, Washington, D.C., up and down the East Coast. So, And I still have some other talks in the area, mainly in New England where I live. Um, so there's no uh, shortage of information you can gather about the book. Or me, and I also want to give a plug for another book that's coming out in June of mine. There are no killers in it other than meteorological killers, but it's a it's a book on the uh, history of America's hurricanes. It's called A Furious Sky: The 500 Year History of America's Hurricanes, and there is a small section in it that deals with piracy, but uh, it's really more of a meteorological and historical uh, tale of mayhem and destruction and scientific evolution. And it was really a lot of fun to write. And hopefully it'll be fun for people to read. Hurricanes are, are definitely notorious, right? Yes, they are notorious. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Again, I've been talking to Eric J. Dolan. His book is called Black Flags, Blue Waters, The Epic History of America's Most Notorious Pirates. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.